Physicist with a long career in uh, uh, research and he's written over 130 papers and articles. He's written three books. Um, we are very honored to have him, so please welcome Bernie Hesch. Well, thank you very much. And uh, she mentioned the book for sale out here. I don't know if she wants to do that. So, listen to the whole thing. It's a nice little book to hear and think about. As she said, I'm an astrophysicist, and so I thought I'd admire Stephen Hawking, like Stephen Hawking. I come to a little bullshit night and pretty much. I thought that's Stephen Hawking. I bet Stephen Hawking has some interesting insights right now and things that he never thought were possible. <laughs> anyway, this is a lecture I gave a little over a year ago in India. And so there's going to be a bit of a religious flavor to this. It's not strictly an astrophysics talk at all. But uh, I think you'll find it very interesting and it's certainly thought provoking. Um, one of the things I'm going to talk about is um, proofs. And here's a proof I made up myself. I'm not a philosopher, but I thought I'd give it a try. Coming up with a, an example of a, of, a form, of a proof about a, an esoteric thing, a metaphysical thing, following the lines of logic you usually would do. So this is very simple compared to the, uh, the theorems about God that. Uh, that exist. Let's look at the elements of it. If we make the assumption that God is infinitely just, then the justice requires proportionality between the punishment and the offense, which in the Mercado and the Golden and Sullivan sing about. Uh, since human life is limited in time, no human can commit infinite evil. So no one can commit infinite evil. But if the punishment in hell for a finite evil would be infinitely unjust. Therefore, since God is just, hell cannot exist. Now, I think this is actually it's not a bad little proof. But the, uh, there have been, of course, many, there have been many efforts to try to come up with something like this to prove the existence of God. And uh, there are five classical philosophical proofs. I'm not going to go into this at all because they're very, very esoteric and tied up in details and it's a really pleasant. But uh, the Aristotelian, the Neoplatonic, the Bastinian, the Communistic, and Leibniz, these are the five classical uh, arguments, or the people that advance the classical arguments about the existence. Of God. For example, was someone who actually succeeded at this. He was a mathematician and kind of chum and buddy of Einstein's who worked together at the Institute for Advanced Studies at Princeton. And uh, Gabriel worked for many years on, on the proof of the existence of God and came up with one that he thought was, was correct. But it took many, many years to try to, uh, frame to try to uh, test that to see if it was correct. But it turns out a couple of years ago, a couple of computer scientists programmed a computer and go through the deep logic from Gabriel's proof found that indeed, Gabriel was probably correct. So Gabriel was the uh, modern mathematician who demonstrated, at least in his formal logic, his modal algebra, that God can exist. So, uh, those are the proofs of God, which aren't really, I mean, you're not going to convince anybody. Not, not, not an atheist. No atheist you can sway by that. And uh, they're interesting to um, go there, I don't know, they well, they're from algae. But uh, in fact, you really need to turn to empirical evidence to try to show that there's a uh, good argument for God. The Big Bang itself, by the way, surprisingly, is kind of an argument for God. And I say that because we, at the time of the uh, discovery of the, uh, well, when Einstein developed his theory of relativity, his general relativity, it was at that time that the universe was regarded as being infinite in extent. And age was in terms of time. So, the infinite universe, the timeless universe, was what the most astronomers thought was the case. And then, potentially, if we compare to that, uh, Genesis was more accurate. Genesis talked about the exploding, basically, the records of life. Now, I'm not saying that's a good explanation, it's not, but, but at the time of the uh, development of general relativity, I would say the atheistic side of religion had a better insight on it than the astronomers did, because it turned out that space is not infinite and is not timeless, but in fact, it's not the Big Bang. 
So in that sense, in a very tiny way, the, uh, the side for God has, has sort of advantage over the general astronomical view of things 100 years ago. But really, the, uh, the big arguments in favor of the, of the, of the God come about because of the, uh, what I call the Goldilocks principle, the just right values of some of the laws of nature and the constants of nature. There are many of these, um, and I'll talk about some of them shortly. And these, uh, these are the, the reasons that we're able to have a universe in which uh, life exists, because we have the right constant of nature that the planets form, the right galaxies form, that provide energy for planetary surface from the stars, and the right temperature, let evolution happen. By the way, evolution is something I certainly strongly believe in. So whenever I say here, don't go away thinking I'm against evolution or not, because evolution is part of the, if I can put it this way, evolution is kind of part of the divine plan. You need something like evolution to carry forth the, uh, the drive for diversity to occur and life to evolve. Uh, and so I'm very, very much a back of relativity of, of, uh, of evolution. Your death experiences, I think, are excellent evidence. Uh, I think many of you have heard many stories about that, your death experiences, and they're quite compelling. And then lastly, a simulated universe. What I mean by that is that if we have lots of evidence that there may be you know, a creator behind this universe of ours and this world of ours, uh, if we can come up with some way to explain how in the world he did some of this stuff, it sounds very preposterous, but I think there's a logic behind it, then, uh, then that gives a bit more evidence to believe that, that there's more to the universe than simply a materialistic point of view that science offers. So the uh, simulated universe is what I would talk about. Can't hear what he's saying. Okay. The Big Bang is, as I said, prior to Einstein's general relativity, the uh, universe is thought to be infinite in size and ageless. Well, that would prove not to be the case. In fact, Einstein made the uh, this cosmological constant because he wanted to keep a static universe. And the universe that he uh, developed, or the theoretical model he developed of the universe in his general theory of relativity was such that it would collapse unless it was held up by something. And so he, he made up a cosmological constant to basically give the universe a, uh, a prop to keep it from, re from uh, from uh, re-combining. Um, the scientists speculate that a quantum fluctuation of some kind for, for no reason at all, uh, but that's simply speculation. In fact, we think that the universe could be made by a, a, a random fluctuation. You have to ask yourself, well, how can something even fluctuate if there's nothing at all? There's really nothing, 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 nothing. Where can you get a fluctuation? And in fluctuation, there's a depends that there is some law of nature that says, ah, some Fluctuation of energy is possible. But there is no energy, there's no nothing prior to the Big Bang. And so the idea of there being an argument that, uh, you know, well, in place of that, I would say, we would like to have a creator behind the causation of the universe as regards fluctuation. But in both cases, we really have no evidence. And the fluctuation theory that the scientists espouse is really no more than the, the words. No one really knows. Now it turns out that there are, and this is, by the way, is pretty mainstream, I think it's the last 20, 20 years even, that there are certain values that the concept of nature have that allow, um, what, what you want is to have a universe in which stars uh, exist, in which stars form exist, and in which the, uh, some of the residue of stars form planets and then all their own stars, and they're all parts of galaxies. So the uh, necessity for, for that right kind of Set of conditions, let stars form, let planets form, and thereby let surfaces of the planets possibly host life. Uh, those constants of nature that let that be possible are pretty narrow in, 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 uh, in range. In fact, in some cases, if you had a change of more than 1% from the value that actually exists to that constant, you wouldn't be able to have some of the necessary conditions for life for planets to, to uh, exist. There are at least seven others beyond these. But for example, look at the um, water. Water is kind of unusual. Uh, molecule in that the boiling point is quite high. It's quite high, high enough, so there remains a liquid in, in critical range for biology to occur. And also, water is less dense when it's frozen, which is kind of odd. But if it's, if it's less dense when it's frozen, it floats. Well, that's good because if ice sank to the bottom of the ocean, then the ocean would freeze to the bottom up, and you wouldn't be able to have life. So, and, and apart from the fact that even though you're marking, you would not get to say if the, the, the ice would float to the bottom. So, that's a very important consideration. Um, the ratio of the gravitational to the electric force is another example of that. If you want a, a neutral wind, a force like gravity, it would be very weak. So if you have planets forming, 
If the gravitational force of the of well, nature were as strong as the electric force, we'd never have a planet. The planet would be squeezed down into some tiny. So you have to have these ratios just right and the laws of nature be just right. If you get a universe that's, uh, that's uh, um, basically uh, friendly to life. Now we've discovered something like two or three thousand planets around other stars from the Kepler Observatory. This is lots and lots of planets out there. In fact, it's not estimated, I didn't believe this. But there are maybe a hundred, maybe as many as a, how many, about a hundred billion planets in the Milky Way galaxy. Like one planet for every star, pretty much. At least. And this is totally different than the view that existed when I was a kid. Well, when I dreamed about becoming an astronomer many years ago in the 50s and 60s, back then, you know, I just thought that, well, maybe the, the Earth is the result of some random and very unlikely happening. But now we have many, many stars that have been discovered. And many of these are in the habitable zone where they're close enough to their, their parent star that they can get the right amount of radiation, let chemicals like water form, and, uh, and to provide the kind of heat without scorching, without freezing, so that life at all. So it's quite a different universe in terms of biological capability now than it was uh, 30, 40, 50 years ago. Other evidence for God, this of course not astronomical at all. That needn't be because this is, I think, actually, this, this is as strong an argument as I can think of. The um, experiences people have had when they've entered into the other realm beyond the physical is uh, it's quite impressive. In fact, the, the co-author of my book, you know, something back there, is Tommy Tompkins. And he's the one who actually did the, the hard work of bringing about the book by Evan Alexander on his, uh, his near-death experience. He was a doctor, a neurosurgeon of Alexander. And he contracted a um, uh, E. coli bacterial meningitis, not pretty bad to me, and uh, went into a coma for five days, in which time he thought, I mean, later on he was resuscitated, but when he looked back on that time, he said, well, the logic was, well, look, you know, I think I was brain dead. I don't know what has happened to me. I thought I walked into these worlds where I've seen other beings, other landscapes, other, well, tremendous, uh, beautiful sights, and he took this to be real. I, I, I think it would be real too, actually. But Tommy Tompkins is the one who um, actually made that book uh, a bestseller. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Proof of Heaven is that, and uh, he's the book, he's the, uh, the co author of the book that I'm selling here tonight. Proof of God. Proof of God, yes. <laughs> Which is you know, surprising enough, like the title of my talk tonight here. And also, the past life experiences of children, I think, are pretty compelling. I knew Ian Stevenson for quite a while, and he was a very thorough, meticulous researcher. And um, he found many examples of children who remember previous lives, sometimes with birthmarks, that can be associated with the the person that, that uh, the, the child was in the previous lifetime. And uh, Professor Stevenson was a full professor, tenure professor at the University of Virginia, and uh, certainly very, very um, nitpicky, but that nitpicky in a positive sense, nitpicky kind of guy who uh, came up with, uh, who wrote several books on this and many articles on, on reincarnation. So that is, constitutes an awful lot of evidence uh, of, of God. And lastly, well, it's in the universe. That's what we're going to talk about mostly for the rest of the, of the talk. If we have a, some idea of how, how God can make the universe, and then have these foundations to say, how does God make the universe? Uh, that would also give us a hand, give us more additional thought of thinking that, uh, well, yeah, there really is an immortal universe, except for the, the material, physical aspects that science covers. By the way, the ancient design of viewpoint is that life is an illusion. It's not, you find that sort of thing in other religions too, but in the especially. And uh, there I say, here's how it's done. Well, I think I, I think I have something to call it done. Hawking said, if we ever discover a complete theory, then we shall be able to take part in the discussion of the question of why it is that we and the universe exist. It would be the ultimate kind of human reason for them to show the mind of God. Um, but that's very good. I mean, those, those words sold a lot of books. In fact, uh, what he meant to say was, we would know the mind of God, we would know everything that God would know if there was a God, but there isn't. I'm an atheist. <laughs> well, okay, he was an atheist up until about two days ago. Let's see. Uh, a theory of everything. So, uh, in some sense, I'm presenting a theory of everything to tonight. Uh, it's one of the major unsolved problems in physics. No doubt that the physicalist basis is taken for granted for everything. When scientists say we want a, a uh, theory of everything, 
but they wanted something that is based on materialism. It gives you everything. So, you know, they, the, the forces of nature, the drama, the nuclear interaction, the gravitational electric field, those and the particles, you know, the, the protons and electrons that work and all that. Somehow these things all work together in some way to give you a, uh, a completely coherent, uh, satisfying model of the universe, and that would be a theory of everything. And I don't think it's ever going to happen going on this path, because I think the path is totally wrong. And I think that there is a, there's good reason to think that the, uh, that the world is not comprised of these things whatsoever, but that consciousness is, a, is the origin of everything, including of ourselves and the world around us. Can there be a, so that leads us to the question, can there be a constant based theory of everything? And, uh, and I think there can be. Uh, yes, right. So consciousness not as primary, but as a sole constituent of our universe, another possible universe of the reality. So what I'm proposing is that the consciousness is the one and only thing that the one and only thing that exists everywhere, here on Earth, in the universe, everywhere. I think the only thing that exists is consciousness. And the explanation of why we can say that and how how this drives with the the world around us is full of things and energies is what I want to talk about. And I think in fact the reason that that we have some insight in this now is because we're, we're basically doing the same sort of thing uh, ourselves, and we make toys to the market, you know, to the to kids that are actually working along the same lines as, as this. That is, we're developing things that are very, very realistic, mm-hmm. and that uh, they come about. Uh, well, you, we can now create artificial worlds in a, in a box, a play box, and those are getting more and more realistic. Mm-hmm. And I think that's really kind of the that's the example of what we're doing here in real life. Our true nature is as being the consciousness, in which the universe that we operate in is a playground and school. But I think there exists a vast transcendent consciousness or, or cosmic mind, and that of course is described. I mean, you, you, some people don't like the idea of using the word God. Uh, I could have said here, I guess, great consciousness, transcendent consciousness, uh, what else did I say up there? Cosmic mind, all these things. They're really, what comes right down to it, they're all different. This way of saying God. God is about children, so it's not so it's very easy right? So can there be a consciousness-based theory of everything? Yes. Now, virtual reality is the creation of a simulation. Let's see here. Yeah, virtual reality is the creation of a simulation for a present to our senses in such a way that we experience it as if it were really there. If the games that are being marketed now are really realistic. What you do is you, you have your avatar that goes and does battle on the field with uh, other avatars. And you're, you're standing outside of all this, but you make the avatar move around and do what you want. You kind of put yourself, this avatar becomes your alter ego. And uh, it can be very realistic and very, very thrilling to do that. But I think that this makes a very good model for what probably is really going on in terms of the creation of the universe for those for us. You know, Operate in. See, I see ourselves as offsprings of, of, of God. That this, there is a, an entity, which I call God, that has infinite ability. Maybe, maybe infinite, or maybe it's just unbounded. I'm not sure which is which, which. But in any case, not, not limited. But that there is then, I mean, if you can imagine a, such, a, such an entity being lonely, I really don't think it is, but if it really is the one and only thing, the one and only thing, it kind of does put a little bit of, sort of pressure on it to create something. And how can you know who you are if you never be, are able to act out what you are? If you never act it out, all you ever know is that you have certain rules that, that you abide by to play a game, that you never play the game. That would be a funny kind of existence. And so I see uh, us as being uh, entities that are sort of brought forth from God. We are sort of like flames from the bonfire, and then we are given the universe to go into. And the reason for this universe is to experience things. So if God wants to experience a going and watching the Giants play a ball game, uh, he needs a human being to do that. That's okay. We're all here. We are able to do these things, do all sorts of things. And uh, then bring back to this God the experience of doing that. And perhaps this may, this is perhaps a little far out of the, uh, suggestion, but perhaps there is a way that God can't evolve himself. How can you evolve if you're a single solitary thing of no real existence, but all existence at the same time is the paradox? How can you uh, learn what you are, appreciate what you can do, without creating circumstances that let you do that? 
Well, if we are all little fingers of God, then we're sort of thrown out into the world at large, and into this universe to see what can be done here, then we become very valuable instruments for God to understand himself, and perhaps as I say, to evolve himself through us, which makes us kind of pretty important. And I don't mean, by the way, to limit this to human beings. Obviously not. I think it happens to be happening on animal level. And certainly that would apply to any other civilization else in the universe, which there must be many, I'm sure. So I think it's the same thing everywhere. God wants to know what's like to be a mosquito. There are plenty of mosquitoes around. I bring that experience back to him when they're, when they're swatted by me when I go, when I go camping. Yeah. 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 The, uh, this was an advertisement from about a year ago. Uh, the comment here is, I'm testing the Oculus headset in a mountain climbing simulation. The experiment, experiment, uh, experience, teleports me to a jagged cliff. Okay. The experience teleports me to a jagged cliff in a virtual world, so realistic that I can barely look down. When I do, my knees buckle and my palms sweat. Finally, my brain has to interrupt. Dude, you're not really there. Now, this is, imagine what these things would be, these capabilities would be like 100 years from now, or 1,000 years from now, or 10,000 years from now. You know, absolutely no difference between the experience and, and the life, probably. Pretty slower, yes. Slower, yes. And louder. Louder? Is this not turned up loud enough? Everyone understands? Not everyone. Okay, well, I'm talking loud, we raise the volume. <laughs> In his uh, recent book, uh, Seth Lloyd, who is a professor at MIT, I believe, made a prediction that uh, in around, in not too many years, I think something that sells us 600 years, we will be able to reproduce virtually the entire universe in a simulation. Now, of course, you can't do that in a little particle because there's not enough room. But in fact, the capabilities of a, of a simulation will be tremendous. So that it may the simulation tool become something more than a toy. Now, I know it's speculated that the whole universe can be simulated in a computer in 600 years. Now, of course, that number is totally pulled out of the air. But to give you some idea that you know, we're not talking about a billion years, we're talking about something that's very, very short time scale. And we then would have great virtual reality capability that would be amazing. So the, the false self simulation hypothesis. Well, now, as interesting as this uh, virtual reality can be, uh, the use to which it's put is sometimes very odd. And what I'm getting at here is that the, the argument goes, well, if a computer gets smart enough, we can create virtual realities of all sorts, all sorts of simulations. Okay, that's great. But then they go, they go they, by day, I mean, the scientists pursuing this sort of um, innovative computer research would argue that well, maybe at some future point we'll discover that we don't exist. <laughs> we don't exist because really we're not human beings, but really what we are is we're software and some other, but somebody's computer. <laughs> Somewhere a thousand years from now, there's a computer geek. And he's in his bedroom at night, you know, and doing what geeks do, playing with his computer, and he decides to create a civilization. And he creates a civilization like the Earth, and gives us a, a universe to be in, and then gives us each uh, our consciousness, so to speak. We're all just little software being being um, called about in this computer. This, uh, I sort of think this is the, uh, the digital jar, digital brain in the jar kind of argument. Um, now that's terrible. I mean, I think this is a horribly, a horribly horrible perspective on what uh, what might be the essence of reality. <laughs> that, our, that our current universe is merely a computer-based simulation being run by far more sophisticated intelligences. Maybe it's a homework project or a PhD project of some you know, computer programmer in the year 2900. And the bottom one, of course, is that we ourselves are no more than that. We are our artificial intelligence for the vast system. We're deluding ourselves that we are real, but it is until the plug is pulled. So that, that's what uh, some of our investigations along these lines is leading to. And uh, I'm thinking that this whole approach can be redirected by saying, yes, uh, we can simulate universes very well, thank you. So we're not going to put them in the use of pretending that there are no real human beings anywhere. Instead, if we are in, this, in a reality that is being fed this information about the virtual universe, and we can act in it, then we don't. Uh, then we can take our conscious nature, project it into the avatar, and we can actually be the avatars for the time being. That's pretty close. You know, we put on clothes or we put on a costume for acting in a play, 
And in this sense, we are putting on the uh, mantle of humanity to bring back the God experiences that we have when we become avatars in this game of virtual universe. So I see nothing wrong with virtual universe. In fact, I see it in a very logical way to, um, to have things happen, but not I am too down here. I am too down here, I think it's horrible. Let me give you one more reason why you might want a virtual universe over a, uh, a real one. Can you imagine making a house out of water? Not, not ice, but out of water. You're constructing a house out of water. You can't do it because water doesn't have the right properties to be a structure. It's, it's logical to do that. But if you wanted to have a, a software program that made a house out of water, no problem. You know, a few pieces of software will make, make that happen in your, in your simulation. You can make things happen in the simulation that can't be made no matter what. And I would argue that even God cannot make a liquid house. But it's contradictory to itself. But you can do that in a computer if you want to. A little software would make that happen, no problem. So you have actually more freedom to make things, all sorts of diverse things happen you know, in a simulated reality than you have in the real world. So the, the uh, view here is that um, everything that exists is the output of the universe, which is a really a huge computer. And so as I said, you can use this uh, argument both to propose a universe in which there is no real human being whatsoever, just software being executed in a computer, or you can use this to be the, uh, the basis for which God can experience, to experience all of his potential through the beings that he creates temporarily, it's us, and then going to the virtual reality to experience that. You get to be on Mars, get to be on the Earth, get to be on the Centauri this way, and then all those things back to the ultimate. And then I find item number two kind of interesting. Neil deGrasse Tyson has sort of become the latest new Carl Sagan, I guess, uh, put the odds at 50 50 that our, unit, our, unit, our entire universe is a program on someone else's hard drive. You see, there, there's the, the view that uh, that's, that's all we are. I kind of hate to see it happening, really given the uh, so much credence by people developing these notions, instead of seeing that this, this whole um, ability to create virtual universes is a much better use than to pretend that we're not real, that we're just part of the simulation. And we're solving with nothing but that. This is kind of sad. <laughs> and this, uh, Ray Kurzweil suggested that maybe our whole universe is a science experiment of some junior high school student in another universe. Mm -hmm. Yeah. In this view, we do not actually exist as other than algorithms in a supercomputer. So it's bad enough to believe that your existence will end someday. But in the simulation hypothesis, you never had a real existence in the first place. So don't, don't worry about it. Don't be sad. We're here to end it to begin with. But the, uh, so the, the, the conscious sub-simulation hypothesis argues that consciousness is the one and only reality. And it can never be explained. It's fundamental. I mean, I don't know what consciousness is. It's up in my head. I can experience it. I can't, I can't tell, it, tell you where it is in some other some other words because the words are less evocative than the language and than the experience. And you all know what consciousness is. You have it. We're all sitting here not exercising that. So I think it's really foolish to try to think that we can explain that away. The scientists that are doing this mainly rely upon correlations, string correlations with uh, activities or with uh, sense impressions. You, know, you put your scalpel here in this part of the brain and the, uh, the patient will experience this or that. You know, that's considered to be evidence that consciousness arises from this or that part of the brain. And I don't think it does. I think you've got the, 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 you've got the, the whole thing backwards. It's consciousness that gives rise to reality, rather than the reality that cannot create any consciousness. Because if consciousness, how can something that is as ephemeral and as non material as consciousness arise from something that is, that is simple and elementary as atoms and molecules? It just doesn't make any sense. But the other way around, it makes perfect sense. It makes sense also to assume that those atoms and molecules, while they follow laws of nature, that that you know, looks like real stuff, are again part of the simulation. The laws are part of the simulation. The things that you that come about, the virtual atoms that come about are part of the simulation. It's all a simulation, but we are real. We are, we are immortal consciousness, embedding ourselves in these, these vast games that can be played for virtues of recreation, for virtues of, for reasons of learning, of reducing your entropy, of bringing back the God experiences that perhaps even make the God greater than he was, if that's possible. 
This view also eliminates the need for consciousness to emerge from the physical world via some mechanism. You know, we don't know what a mechanism to do that, but still, eventually, later on in the century, I think scientists will come to recognition that they're going down this view of trying to explain everything from consciousness is the first basis of everything it is the wrong way to go. And that physical reality we perceive is an illusion in a specific scientific sense, namely that um, it's part of a program that, uh, well, we're, 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 we're an immortal part of. Oops. I'm going to boss, get that much. So we know that these things are often said to be divine and they transcend the consciousness or cosmic mind. So as I said, they're done specifically so that it may yield experience in the creator of everything. Nothing exists except the mind and its ideas. Bishop George Barclay said that uh, several hundred years ago. And uh, some of my favorite people, Sir James James, a brilliant astrophysicist of the last century. The stream of, now let's just read what it says about the ah, and from the middle, mind. Mind no longer appears as an accidental intruder in the realm of matter. We ought rather to hail it as a creator and governor in the realm of matter. So he's saying that the, uh, that the world is more like a, um, I guess in the top, I shouldn't skip that, but it says the universe begins with more like a great thought, like a great machine. The universe is a great thought. That's really another way of saying what I've been talking about. So Robert Bennington said the same thing, actually. Uh, he wrote a book called um, uh, The Mysterious, uh, Mysterious Universe was by, by Genes. Uh, Science in the Unseen World was the book that uh, he wrote. He was probably the, the most, the number one astrophysicist of the of Britain around the turn of the last century, 1920, thereabouts. You can see here's Hobnobbing with Einstein in his garden. So uh, he, was, he was himself a Quaker. And he felt that there was still an inner voice that would come to him and give him, and I'll tell him whatever silly, silly voice is doing. But uh, he also believed that consciousness is not whole here, and primarily the device for sense impressions, that consciousness was something that was the beginning of all things. So it's a pretty good company there, and like you people like this who thought it was that really the universe is more like a thought than like a machine. I mean, there are the two books last of uh, Anything's Science and the Unseen World. Published in 1929 by McMillan. And then in the right, we have Mathematical Theory of Relativity. And I put that up there because uh, I, you know, Eddington was the one who actually took Einstein's Theory of Relativity and turned it into a textbook. In fact, it was the only, at the time, he said, the only three people in the world who understood relativity. <laughs> and I think that Eddington was almost asked about who the you know, people were. And he said, Well, I understand. And Professor Einstein does this in theory, but I can't imagine the third one was. So. <laughs> Uh, by the way, that book on the right was one I, I used when I was a graduate student, so it was tough. It was all tensor, 200 pages of tensor calculus. I didn't, I didn't get all the way to the end, but it was a pretty neat. <laughs> tough stuff. Now, but the essence of a computer is not, it's not well, the essence of a computer is not electronics. That's just how it's done. Electronics only is the, the means by which this platform called a computer does things. The essence of a computer can be done via thought. So what I'm proposing is that that God, of course, God does not have a supercomputer, he doesn't need one. But what he has is a super mind. The super mind can play the role of the computer if you want to. Now, I can imagine taking a line of code, or a whole book of code, and then reading the different, the, the, the different instructions, I can read them all day long, from top to bottom. It wouldn't give me a lot of good back to read that. I could implement the computer code in my mind by reading all the instructions. Three boy way to pass in a day or a year. But if you're God, you have a computer code that you made up, you can read it quite pretty fast, infinitely fast. And you can program a reality that's just like computer code, except it's thoughts. You process the thoughts page after page, just the way a human being with electronics would, would, would uh, have a computer code uh, act things out. And so if you're God, I, I think, I mean, I hope I'm saying the right thing, if you if God you put your computer code that does all the things that a human computer code does, except does it under his mind, he's processing them. And so this is the way I think that, that God might go about creating virtual realities by creating something that's like our software and implementing it. Running the software instead. And by the way, that also is uh, with, uh, or is, 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 uh, consistent with the, the observation that St. Augustine made who was 600 years ago. That if God would have, would have taken his mind away from the universe for one second, it would be gone. That God's continual attention is required to keep the universe going. 
You see, the question was, what would be 50 or thereabouts? And it's against the system of what I'm saying, and God chose to stop the computer code running his head, the universe is going to come to a stop. So that's a nice bit of agreement between modern science and writing of St. Augustine. Can you say Augustine and then uh, come through? St. Augustine did not come through? Yeah, not this. Oh, St. Augustine. <laughs> There's a little bit of thinking about the universe. I know that was just kind of a cool picture. He doesn't really, he doesn't really tell us anything, but a cool picture. Uh, and then the, the idea of God being the kind of, the kind of guy that would develop a computer code, implement it to create realities, uh, there's, there, there's some evidence for this sort of thing because the question of whether God is a mathematician is one that has kind of a long history. This is a book by Mario Livio, who was a, one of the astronomers of the Space Telescope Science Institute. He wrote the book, Is God a Mathematician? He's not the first to ask this question, but. But he simply, he simply presents a mystery. The apparent omnipresence, omnipresence, omnipresence and omnipotent powers of mathematics. Reason this type of characteristics one normally associates only with the deity. So why does uh, well the question has been asked many times, why does the nature, why is nature so uh, well described by mathematics? Like sometimes mathematics has been developed in which there's no physical correspondence, yet they don't find there is. For example, the, um, the, the non-linear geometry, non-linear non geometry of, um, of general activities was developed by John Hathaway in the early part of the 19th century. He developed non-linear non geometry, curved space in other words. No use for it, no one knew what to do with it, just interesting mathematics. But Monty Meinstein, 100 years later, and by golly, that was the basis of general relativity. Why is that? Why would general relativity you know, perform itself in this Curved space time that was developed mathematically 100 years previous. It just seems like everything in the universe, laws of the constant nature, and things that you can build in the universe, somehow all come back to that mathematics. It makes you think that God is kind of a mathematician. In fact, to some extent, he may be mathematics. And I say that, and then of course, raise, you know, God, mathematics, or God is terrible. But maybe in some sense, part of God is, is, is mathematics. So that seems to be the basis of just about everything. The universe of creation has been designed by a pure mathematician, who James Jean said that. And Einstein said, how is it possible that mathematics, a part of human thought, and its independent experience, is so excellent in the object of physical reality? And then lastly, Wigner. Yes. Wigner wrote the enormous usefulness of mathematics and the natural sciences to something boring on the mysterious, and that there is no rational explanation for it. And the same question, why does mathematics work the way it does? Now, let's think about, um, having said this much, let's think about if there's some way to test this. I might just, you know, uh, stop you off out here and up here there's nothing to back what I'm saying. Well, but there are some things that, that are coming around as far as ability to test, and maybe technologically we might be able to test before too long. But these are some things that come to mind. Pixelated space time. Well, pixelated means we don't have continuous space time, we have a discrete space time, we'll chunk, one, two, three, four, five, six, you know. Font length, font mass, font time, the existence of those things as pixelations. There's some evidence that some, some evidence that I'm talking too fast. I'm always complaining. <laughs> yeah, they are. <laughs> yeah. And that uh, that that's evidence that their that space is is uh, discrete, not continuous. Uh, maximum speed, the speed of light is maximum speed. Well again, that can be explained in terms of processing power in a computer. If you have uh, you have to have something from pixel A to pixel B. It takes a certain amount of time depending on your computer. And so you can't move it across the screen. So this might be the basis for the constancy of the speed of light. Objects are random only when they're observed. Now this, this unfortunately puts me in a position of saying, if a tree falls in the forest and no one's there to hear it, it's make a sound. And I hate to say it probably does not. Because in this case, you only render something when it's needed for some new thing to, to observe it. And if you're no one observing it, it doesn't happen. You have a waste of computing power, waste of the bandwidth, have something happen, and there's no one there to appreciate that. Cosmic beginning, the big bang, the big bang becomes sort of like a booting up of the computer, and doesn't it? It's also a ready explanation of quantum entanglement. If two particles are entangled with each other, you're able to, to, to stay entangled for, who knows, maybe light years of distance, so they can do something to one, one pair of the entangled pair of electrons, that only reacts to it. How does that happen? These two electrons that are carrying opposite properties 
If one often space in different directions, maybe, and then we do something in one in the laboratory, the other one responds to that, even though it may be light your way. That's it's not something I'm making up. This is very standard physics in quantum mechanics. That's a very easy, easy explanation in terms of the fiber, in terms of a virtual universe. Things that are far apart here, in the, apparently in the, in, the, in the real world, apparently, they're right next to each other in the simulation. I mean, right here they are in the simulation. They're not they're light years apart, they're right there next to each other on the screen. But they look like they're far, they're far apart, and they, they are for all practical purposes. For all practical purposes, this virtual world is, is the real world. And these are, these are some of the reasons you might think that. The particles of a given clock are absolutely the same. And every, every gamma electron is in there, gamma electron. Exactly. It sort of sounds again like a computer property. Empty space is not empty at all. It's full of computer like things, it's full of zero point energies. Uh, space time is not fundamental in this view, but the, the computer and its properties are. And uh, the processing limitations would give you the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. Because you can't have you can't have perfect knowledge of things in terms of perfect position, perfect uh, velocity, or conversely perfect, not conversely, but also perfect uh, knowledge of energy versus time for something to happen. And that, the reason is that you have to process something. It takes time to process something. You can't have infinite correctness with the computer, you have all the round off errors, and time to calculate. So this is a good <coughs> the system of the universe is not perfect, but that's discrete, a digital universe, not that's one we envision. And then unless we have found... Okay, but Ula, before you go to the next slide, would you repeat kind of like the key point at the end of, that you were saying, but slowly... The very last yeah. one? Yeah, the last point. Last point, point. is the processing limitations. Or whatever your last couple of points were, but oh. very slowly. All right, well, let me go through it slowly then. All right, whole thing. Yeah. Pixelated space-time. We know that there is such a thing as Planck length and Planck mass and Planck, uh, Planck velocity. And uh, these are uh, sort of limits of how much of, of that stuff can, uh, a particle or, or yeah, a particle can have. And that uh, pixelation is suggestive of a universe that's not continuous like ours, like we imagine ours, but that is like a computer that's discrete. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, discrete chunks of things. And uh, objects uh, would be, a maximum speed would be a way to explain something like the speed of light. Why is the speed of light exactly C? What made it be that? Not, I can't go any faster than that. The answer may be that you, you really are imagining things that are far apart, but they're really next to each other in, in your simulation, in your, whatever your software is, whatever your, your, your workstation is. And the workstation is making this, you know, go so far with respect to each other, but you can't, you can't move things across your, your workstation. You're limited to what you, what you have as a you know, processing power in front of you. The cosmic beginning as a booting up. It's like the Big Bang is like a booting up of your computer. And we can also read this thing quantum entanglement because we know that when you can uh, have two particles have, uh, have complementary properties, you send them off in different directions. If you make a measurement on one, the other one will have a measurement that corresponds to the one on the, on the first particle, the first electron. Well, that's inexplicable in terms of our thinking that they have to communicate over the uh, distances that are very great, and the velocity is limited by speed of light. They don't have to. They, they may appear to be far apart, but really on your screen in your workspace, your workstation, they're right there both together. No problem. They're not separated by light years there. They're separated by inches there. I'm making up these numbers, of course, but you get the idea. Uh, particles at a given time are absolutely the same. And I've never met an electron that's different than the other electron. It's perfectly the same. Just like you expect by cloning stuff in a computer. Space time is not fundamental in this case, the computer, uh, computer limitations are. And uh, the processing power of the computer is limited. You can only get so much accuracy, you can't have you know, 100, 100 place accuracy in a computer, 100 digits. Uh, you, can't, uh, you can't complete things infinitely quickly, it's time to compute something. And so these processing limitations are just right for giving you an Einstein, uh, an Einstein, a Heisenberg uncertainty principle. So there's a lot of good stuff behind uh, the idea that um, a digital universe has properties that very much correspond to what our universe really does when we look at it carefully. <coughs> so, uh, the measurement that was, uh, yes, this I got out of a MIT technology review. The measurement that would reveal the universe as a computer simulation. There is actually, there's this actual way to experiment with this. And that is to look at the, the highest energy cosmic rays. And if there's a cutoff for these cosmic rays. Theoretically, it's just, this limit is known as the infinite. And there are readers, Grison Zatzepin Kuzman, better known as the JKZ, JKZ cutoff. 
This cutoff has been well studied. It comes about because high energy particles interact with the microwave background to lose energy. So there is a cutoff that, if, if it can be precisely defined, would, would be attributable to the universe being a simulation and not a real continuous universe. So there's some hope that this could be done, and I don't know to the that this has been done. There's been some evidence in favor of it, but a real definitive conclusion about the universe, and this might be shed some light on the simulation hypothesis. So we're confronted with a um, few different explanations for various things. An inanimate digital superconductor, an inanimate digital supercomputer scaled up by, by 10 to the fifth power, about five as large. Is that what we are? Is that what the universe is? I would say no. Consciousness choosing to act like, like the computer is what we have. So I would say that the, uh, the, the great computer, the great computing uh, power of the, of the universe comes about from not from some great electronics, but from some great intelligence that uses consciousness to choose to act like, like a computer. This part is like a like computer. The chocolate feel it like not to be electronics that our computers at home do, but via highly structured thoughts. And now, our existence in that environment is an illusion that's created, created by the operation of the supercomputer. No, it's the, our, existence, our existence is 100% real. We are 100% real, but as an offspring of the superconsciousness. Our environment is simulation, but we are real. That doesn't make sense. Not our simulation. Is there, and we ourselves are part of the simulation that we are nothing but, but algorithms and computers. No, I don't buy that for a minute. This would also explain paranormal phenomena, by the way, the way particle duality can be explained by virtue of a simulated universe. The entanglement I just talked about, the Heisenberg and certain principle I just talked about, the role of the observer in measurement. Um, again, this is standard physics when I say that the particle that you might measure in a laboratory does not exist until you make the measurement. It does not exist until you make the measurement. That's the Copenhagen interpretation of quantum mechanics, which is the mainstream interpretation. You're not saying something that's, you know, me making this up. I mean, it, it, it broke, it even broke on the philosophy of quantum mechanics. In fact, it's one by um, um, uh, about 10 of his professors called Quantum Enigma. And they say very specifically that if you have something that you're going to measure as an electron scale or an atom, it's not there until you make the measurement. And it has a wave function prior to that. Which is nothing. The wave function is really nothing. You make the measurement, and the wave function then you become particle or something like that. And that becoming it is part of the fact that consciousness has to actualize the reality. Who, so was, it, who was that citation you just mentioned? Rosenblum and Cutler Cut, Cut, Cut Rosenblum. Cutler Cut Rosenblum. The two University of California physicists around the world. One, I think it was the Cut, um, Professor Cutler Cut died recently. But uh, they're available at any good bookstore. And they make the point that, that really it's the, the atom is not existent to the observer makes a measurement. And to me, that was very much like it, consistent with the notion that we have a reality that's being created for our avatar with the rest that it is. So there are things that are just total totally mysteries of classical physics that become very normal to explain in terms of a, a, a model of us being avatars within a simulated universe. So, in terms of going to this, in terms of other empirical evidence, um, there is this. I've met uh, Tom, uh, Tom Campbell, and I think I'm very impressed with what he does, what he has to say. But uh, I myself have never had any strange, abnormal experience that would take me into another reality. Um, I'm a very linear, kind of linear, intellectual person that doesn't have any experientialness of. Like my wife Marcia does here. Uh, so these things that I'm talking about are things that strike me as being realistic, and strike, me, strike me as being whole and, and probably true. Not because I have a great experience to point to, but because I, I think it's illogical. But Tom Campbell has managed to do both of these things. He's a physicist, and he's one of the, one of the first researchers to work with Robert Monroe, and has been on about experiences since the 1970s. And as a result of that, it's gone into very many other environments, many other worlds. Or adjacent to us, or parallel to us. Now, it's easy to blow this away and say, well, this is nonsense. And, you know, if you want to say that, I can't convince you it's not. And I can't say 100% for sure, but I believe it's not nonsense. I think it's 90% certain it's for real. So I've met the guy, I've read his books more than once, thought it over, and I think he actually does, you know, is able to project his mind into other realities. 
In fact, it's not even become so strange these days. A lot of people are talking about this now that when say it's been 20, 30 years ago. His out-of-body experience has led him to see other, other realities. And in these other realities, the conditions are very different. Again, in this, if you look at this as sort of a schematic of what, what we're talking about, there are worlds within worlds within worlds. Some of them are sort of like ours, that have kind of physical life, makeup. They have a lot of physics that are sort of, sort of like ours, maybe not exactly the same. Other realities that maybe have dimensions that don't exist in ours, maybe five, six, seven dimensional. And that, interestingly, takes us into physics. The physicists talk about five, six, seven, in fact, talk about 11 dimensions. So the multidimensionality of what Thomas seeing is not the strange. Uh, the four kind of physics papers talk about different brain universes with different dimensions. And uh, one point that he makes here is that the origin of any one of these universes, when it comes from one that's higher up, the origin of any universe comes to be a mystery. It's the one thing you can't ever explain because it originates higher up. And it's the, the explanation must be found above your level. You can't go beyond your level to explain the universe. It says, thus, the Big Bang is the, sort of the, 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 the point where the balloon is, is tied together. And you can't understand what the Big Bang, where it came from, unless we go to be whatever is beyond the Big Bang, out of which it came. This is something he sees when he traverses these realities. So I throw this out there because I think this, this guy's worth looking at. He has a book called My Big Toe, Theory of Everything, Toe. It's kind of silly fun, but anyway. <laughs> yeah. What does My Big Toe stand for? Theory of Everything, My Big Toe, yeah. Anyway, if I might be told, I suggest you do that. I, I, I get no, no royalties in that, but I'm just saying that it's a damn good book. And uh, there's certainly a food for thought in here about whether or not what he's saying in these other universes is really what you want to believe. And by the way, Campbell does uh, do this, uh, he talks in terms of reducing entropy. He likes to talk about the universe becoming such a a well-formed universe, the one in which things are such, with the inhabitants of such a universe, that they, they, do, they, they do good. They, not everybody does good, but they, they evolve towards good. But he copies this in terms of reducing the entropy. So doing good, he would say, is like, like reducing the entropy. And this was sort of a semi-scientific slant on why a God would create a universe of laws like, like ours, or other laws that are rather different. Reduce, reduce entropy. Reducing entropy then becomes a way of becoming good, good and better. So we capitulate the, the view that the physical world is real and all there is. All there is. Nothing but the physical world and I mean, nothing but the, but the cosmic, cosmologically, nothing but the consciousness created universe. It's all there is, in my view. You can view the physical world is real, but other realities also exist. Well, I think other realities exist, but not because of the physical world. I think we, we see that there are other properties in the universe, other universes that exist, because they're made by conscious, consciousness as well. And this is the way, this is where the, uh, some of my interest came from. But this is going to take us back to the same path as the one that we, that I rejected before, which is the one that takes us to the, the digital, the digital mind in the vast kind of explanation. Are you living in a digital simulation? He brought this up in the uh, early, or about 15 years ago. It's become kind of an active field now. And Nick Bostrom is the one who's behind this. He's on the philosophy factory at Oxford University. And, um, He's persuading some people to become serious about looking at the university as a simulation. And so they said the first half of that simulation is great. <laughs> wonderful, I love it. And the second half of the simulation, which takes us as nothing but computer algorithms, that I reject. <laughs> In fact, he says, Dr. Bostrom makes the argument from the, makes the argument that if you look at the most probable way for this to develop, it becomes slightly more probable that it should happen than it should not. But basically, this almost almost proves that you and I are simulations. He actually goes that far to say it almost certainly proves that we human beings are right now a simulation. That it's slightly yeah, that's the thing that should most easily evolve. If this most easily evolves, that's the thing that should happen. Therefore, we are right now pretending that all this is going on in the system. And again, I, I reject that. So this is basically repeating what I've said before, so I'm not going to dwell on that there's nothing new in this slide. What I was going to talk about, and I'm not sure I'm going to get into this because it's more science, it's not going to take us that far. Um, one thing, let me, let me say a couple of things about this and then let me stop. It's been pretty heavy going probably, talking about the universe created by 
computer and so on. If you um, look out the window, I'm looking at the window over there. I see that uh, most of I see a street light out, light out there. But I also see a big reflection of people in this room. Because the ordinary light, ordinary glass will reflect about 7% of the light back to you. And 96% goes through. And I can see that by looking out the, the, of the, uh, the street. Well, okay. Uh, 96 out of 100 photons will reach the glass, go through the glass, and 4% bounce back. Well, okay, that's fine. But how do the 96 photons know who they are? And how does it, and these photons come along one by one, by the way, they don't come in a bunch. You have photons come along one by one, this is quantum mechanics, come along one by one, either go through the glass or not. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, statistically, if you do it long enough, you'll have 4 to 96, all the ratio 4 to 96. Well, what tells a photon, hey, you're the one that's got to go through it, and you're the one that's going to uh, turn around? But they know this somehow, the photons know what to do. Something's very strange here. Again, this is, this is standard physics. It's impossible to understand standard physics. But with a computer, code, it's easy. I refer to a little, you know, little doodle -doo from there, you know, if you're a photon number such and such, you go this way, if you're a photon number such and such, you go that way. It's very really simple to program this. But explain physically? I don't know how to do that. You know, it, it's like you could think ninety-six percent of every photon goes through, and four percent doesn't. No, before, ninety-six percent of the photons. You can't divide a photon. So ninety-six out of hundred photons go through, and four, four out of four out of not hundred uh, get bounced back. But how does a photon know what to do? This happens just wonderfully, but somehow they've got to count up what's happening in some figurative sense. But again, as I say, this is a, something easy to explain with computer programming. A couple lines of code to take care of it, but impossible to explain in terms of uh, quantum molecular dynamics. And here I could go on more deeply into this, but I don't think I want to do that. Um, I'll just ask you another question, sort of like that. If you have two electrons that are separated by, say, a foot, do you know from Coulomb's law how much they act on each other? They, they push each other apart, right? Two electrons pull each other. Well, how, does, how do they know where they are? How does this photon know that, that a foot away is another, another photon? And this one's on that. Well, what they say in the physics class is there's a field. Okay, there's a field. What, what does that mean? Now, the word field sounds nice, but the field does not give us any further insight into how this, photo, this electron knows where that one is. They have to know where each other is because they have to create a cooling force. And they perfectly well create a cooling force, you know, with all the, the structure of it, the three dimensions. Uh, but how do they know where each other is? How do they know that they're more sensitive with respect to each other? Again, if they're told where they are by a computer code, it's easy. But in terms of physics, knowing where the particles are telling the particles know where they are, it's a matter. So there are some really good reasons to think that the universe may be a simulation. Now, I like the idea that the universe is a simulation, because that opens up all sorts of possibilities for simulating lots of other worlds. And I like the idea that we enter into them as immortal spiritual beings, immortal spiritual beings, and get in, go in and play that game, because that's the only game in town for us, and bring that experience back to the consciousness that created it in order for our experience to become part of his uh, database, or better yet, to become part of his goodness, and thereby make may, may the creator better than he is, the way he learns from us. And I think that, that uh, and I'm early, but I think I'll leave it at that because I'm going to make a lot of questions. Mm -hmm. So, at this point, I can go to the floor. Mm -hmm. <laughs> No questions. Okay, field questions. Oh, yeah, you can ask me later. <laughs> <laughs> Any questions? I'm Marcia, his wife, by the way. Right. He's the one who's experiential. Okay. First one. Do you need a mic or anything? Uh, uh, Marcia, can you turn me around slightly? Face that way. <laughs> by the way, this was a, a slight slip I did there about six weeks ago on, on concrete. And so this is going to disappear. It was this wheelchair. And I'm kind of confined to it right now. But he does have Parkinson's, and that's why he oh. has problems moving his tongue. I'm sorry. Thank you, thank you. Thanks for your patience. <laughs> yes, okay. a question. So, what's your definition of God? Is it some entity that existed before the universe and that created the universe? Or is it the hierarchy in time that God existed in time and then the universe came? Or is it there all the time? Or reading the universe. Well, I don't know the answer to that, obviously. I, I don't know. I've never met God. But what, I'll tell you what I envision. What is, to me, the most rational way to envision a God consistent with all of this. That is that there, there has always existed something. Always existed. 
quite out of space and time, apart from space and time. And I, I don't know how, how I can say that more uh, precisely because I don't know how something can happen outside of time, and yet I think it does. Without time, you can't have A and B be one after the other. So nothing can change without time. And yet, as we said in the mystical traditions, the time stands still. When, they, when the mystics say, or someone having a near-death experience enters that realm, they experience a, a realm without time. I think of it as being perhaps some other kind of time, because if you throw away the time, you can't have anything. Everything becomes stationary. You can't have a cycle, because the beginning and the ending are not separate from each other. There's no change possible. Uh, in terms of whether there is a... I'm trying to think what, what else it was to your question. Um, so I, I picture this God as being one without space and time, having no, no imaginable origin, and being able to do just about anything, but needing us, as is, as is demonstrated by our being here, to accomplish perhaps even the evolution of himself. My best guess. Back there. Uh, I thought you did a wonderful job, Bernie. A fantastic um, ability to assimilate a lot of complex thought and theory. Um, at the same time, there's one place I disagreed, uh, and I wonder why this argument goes on all the time, back and forth, kind of um, the analogy of the tree falling in the forest. Yeah. We obviously don't need a human being there. We could place a tape recorder there, <laughs> come back a day later or a week later, and certainly we'd hear the sound of the right. crackling bushes around it. And, and um, so it almost seems like um, scientific masturbation to me on a certain level. Well, Why do we want to play that game? Well, look, it's, it's a little like, the, like in the laboratory that you create the, you create the particle by making by doing the experiment, by measuring it. Now, in this sense, I would say, look, the, the tree falls, and you've got the tape recorder there or whatever, there's no, no living thing around, not, not a squirrel, not anything, not a turtle, nothing around, and probably there is no sound. But yeah, if someone comes along later and, uh, and plays that tape recorder, the sound may be there. Yeah. Because someone's, you know, someone's come and done an experiment. It's like the quantum experiment, which you make the particle happen. And in your case, you, you might make the, the sound appear sort of out of nowhere because the consistency of the game, the, the stream of data, the database that is reality, you know, we try to match it up as carefully, as, as precisely as we could. And so this would be, of course, a difference between the world as we conceive it now and the world created by laws such as that. But that may be the case. That they, there's no point in simulating something that's never seen. You know, if, if nobody's ever seen some given star from the vantage point of Earth or from somewhere else in space, why why did, why have the star be in your database? I think that the whole thing comes down to the database and having a uh, a, a um, yeah. small enough database to handle things that, as best as possible. And that would include perhaps things like you know making a tree appear if there a human shows up and turns on the tape recorder. Again, again, I'm guessing. I, this whole thing has been huge guesswork. I hope it's been entertaining. But I thought about when your your question. You said it. Um, I mean, following Bernie's line of reasoning, if you have a tape recorder, there's a human being there that's planning to listen to it, so it still goes along. You know, you can't use that argument. Sure, but would we say that the, the, the squirrel or the, or the uh, caterpillar, <laughs> whoever, yeah. if there's no human being, no tape recorder, they still sense that something, you know, well, It wouldn't need to be human. I mean, I think that, you know... Maybe they wouldn't be there. An ant coming, al coming, al coming along has just as much right as human being coming along, you know, to say, well, I've, I've interacted with reality, therefore it has, it has projected itself to me this way. Consistent with my experiences in that, the, the, data, the data stream coming into me from the environment is consistent you know, with my ant experience. And I have now heard this tree from my, from my, my, aunt, uh, database, my aunt data stream, and it happens. Okay. Who knows? We have a question back there. Yeah. It's an observational comment. So everything is uh, vibrational, including the earth. And so, I mean, my, from my, this is part of my observation is, Okay, so the Earth is like a spinning top, and so every time there's a bomb in North Korea, it changes the direction at the top. And that's part of the reason why we have some of our cosmic changes. Because I've noticed in my garden that the sun is not tilting the same way as it used to. Well, I guess I, I, I couldn't agree with that. I mean, the sun has been, been the same over a long, long period of time. Yeah, I mean, and I used to live in a, in a, in a house in downtown, an old house in downtown San Jose, 
And every time there was an earthquake in, uh, in Alaska, even though I wasn't there to observe it, within a few days my, my chandeliers would start vibrating and I knew it was from that. Mm. Interesting. Over there. Um, I want to make a completely different argument. And the argument is as follows. Whenever we are thinking about a complex phenomena as humans, then we use the most sophisticated technology that we currently know as an example. And we can go back in the history of science or medicine and find this through the last couple of hundred years. When people understood how hydraulics works, then the medical image of the human body was <coughs> a system of pumps and yeah, vessels. Yeah. A couple of hundred years later, we understood um, how uh, steam engines work. And so when Freud came and tried to express uh, psychiatry, what he's talking about is we are under pressure, we have to let off steam. So the myth that the imagery of mechanical engineering of the steam age actually determined what psychotherapy is. Today we're in the computer age. We're looking at some very difficult problems. It is good that all of us are interested in consciousness, but we cannot think of anything else but computers to explain consciousness. Mm -hmm. And in 100 years, and this is my argument, we will all look back, and we won't be here in 100 years, but our descendants will look back and say, those people in 2018 had really crazy ideas. They thought the world is a computer, computers could become conscious, everything is a computer because they were in the middle of Silicon Valley and falling or thinking it's computers, computers, computers. The reality is Moore's Law is going to end, Moore's Law is going to end within a decade. And all these projections that we hear from Elon Musk to Stephen Hawking mm -hmm. are based on the false promise that Moore's Law will continue giving us computer power that grows infinitely. It's not going to happen. Well, now, the idea that things change, because our society changes, and that's consistent with the theory, because what we're doing really is we're co-creating reality and then we're going into that reality and experiencing it. So it's not a surprise that that reality should agree with what we see all around us, because that's where it comes from. That's my view of it. That gentleman back there. Hi, I'm sorry I came in a little late, but um, what you're saying, I may be mistaken, but it has a, a bit of a hint of the Schrodinger's cat in terms of the cat Can is alive. Can you speak up a little louder? Oh, yeah, you're, you're I'm thinking of Schrodinger's cat, um, where um, he showed to my satisfaction, that the cat can uh, can either be alive or dead, mm -hmm. uh, equally. And uh, and I thought, wow, that's that's pretty cool. And that kind of stands in with um, uh, quantum theory, I think, um, that you can have the same uh, same uh, particle in two different places at the same time. Um, so I don't, I don't know with all that complexity <laughs> why everything you say isn't just wonderful. I think, you know, it's it's a good uh, a good reach, and um, and I like it. <laughs> so can you can you relate a little bit of what what I was saying in terms? I'm not sure what it is that you like. You like you like it, but whatever it is, I, I, what are you saying you like? Um, when you talk about God as a um, as a designer, a mathematician, mm -hmm. uh, following certain rules, um, um, okay, nothing wrong with that. Um, and uh, I don't see how that um, competes in any way with a Schrodinger's cat. Do you, do you know who uh, gave Schrodinger the idea for, for his cat? Schrodinger's cat? No, who ever gave? Do you know who, who gave Schrodinger the idea for his cat? Yeah. Uh, it, was, it was Schrodinger's dog. Yeah. How did Schrodinger get the idea for his cat? His dog. It was Schrodinger's dog. Good question. Never mind. Get rid of that dog. <laughs> <laughs> question over there. Yeah. All right. First, thank you very much. Uh, I appreciate it. Your, your talk and the, the concept of God, if you will, uh, as consciousness and the, the source of, of the universe is, I think, something that is consistent more with quantum physics as opposed to the materialistic physics which used to, uh, which used to exist. But I do believe, sir, that you have shortchanged yourself. Oh, and at the next level, 
because you have you, you made the point of separating the difference between God's mind consciousness mm -hmm. and our mind consciousness. And in truth, the consciousness of the human, the I am feeling of existence and being, is that not the same consciousness mm -hmm. of the absolute? The only difference being that we limit our Cells, our consciousness, by those physical attributes which we put around that. Exactly. So if you go to, for example, and I, it's interesting that this was given in India, but if you go to, for example, the, the work of Sri Aurobindo in Integral Philosophy, mm -hmm. you have reality existing of consciousness without matter on one end, what we would call God, matter without consciousness on the other end. And it is only by moving between those two that a more complex uh, physical space-time reality exists, which at some point creates human beings, which allows us to experience this, mm -hmm. this particular consciousness. So everything that you say is, I believe, absolutely true. But I think you can take, we can take it even farther, and in future generations will, as we go back to experience the absolute mind of the origin of the universe at that point before space-time exists by uh, quantum physics. Yes, so. I agree with you. I think I'm one hundred percent in agreement with you. And the, the way to express that is it by saying that Brahman and Atman are the same. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And we can. Another statement uh, based upon what Anton is saying. Uh, Walter Russell was a very interesting uh, guy who lived in the, uh, in the, in the 1900s. And uh, his uh, belief is similar in the sense that uh, everything is simulation of consciousness. And God's consciousness and our consciousness, everything is related, mm -hmm. basically. And matter and everything else is created by a system of, uh, in a certain sense, a system of mirrors and and other things of that nature uh, of working with uh, light and creating everything. But it, it goes along with both the simulation aspect of, of things, mm -hmm. that everything is there, but it also goes to the concept of who we really are, and uh, that we are those aspects of God, and therefore our consciousness is related to all that. Yes. And if, you, if people haven't read you know, Walter Russell, that's the, he has a whole series of fascinating Writing. Great. Kevin. Uh, Bernie, I, 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 was at, I wanted to ask you kind of a technical question. Mm -hmm. um, it's about, you were, you were talking about the Planck link, Planck time, and Planck mass. And I understand that, that if you take the Planck link and divide it by the Planck time, you get the speed of light, which yeah, is, you know, makes correct. sense, because that's like fastest speed is the, the shortest time to go the, the shortest distance. Uh, but that, I, I don't quite understand about the Planck mass because the Planck mass is much larger than the smallest mass that we go over. Like 10, like 10, 10, 10, 10, 10 minus 5, so that's, uh, 10, 10 minus 5 grams or something like that is huge, yeah. That's what I thought it is. You're talking about the, the Planck mass, you get that by taking the three basic constants in nature speed of light, the, um, well, let's see, the, uh, the, uh, the uh, Planck constant, and the third one is not uh, G, or gravity. Anyway, so the three, the three fundamental constants, and you combine them in such a way that the units can be mass, and the units can be mass or, or time or um, our energy. And so you get those Planck constants out of simply combining the, the values so that you get the right units. But it is odd that you wind up with a mass that's huge compared to an atomic mass, it's 10 to the minus 5 or so grams. Right, the, the, so the, the Planck mass, I, I think I read somewhere that it's it's the mass that you would, that would be required to create like a black hole with a, a uh, an event horizon that's at the Planck length. Exactly, yeah. You can do it that way too, yeah. That's correct. I worked that through once and it worked out. Yeah. Okay, question? Uh, up until a couple decades ago, the uh, Goldilocks conditions, I thought, explained everything pretty well. And then. A uh, lady astronomer discovered that other universes rotate at different speeds, so they had to come up with dark matter and dark energy 
which accounts for 90 plus percent of everything that is. Mm -hmm. Would you care to comment on that? Well, there's other two mysteries. Yeah, we, uh, the universe that we see is less than 5% of what's out there. Most of the rest is either dark matter, around 20% or dark energy, around 75%. We have no idea what those things are. Dark energy is basically anti-gravity. There's an anti-gravity field that permeates the universe, which causes it to, uh, to not only expand, but to expand and accelerate, to, to, extend, to accelerate, not just expand. No one knows what it is. I mean, it, it could be the same as zero-point energy, except for the fact that there's a 120 order of magnitude difference between the two. Yeah, yeah. As far as as far as we uh, we know, the dark energy, the ratio of the dark energy to the uh, zero-point field energy is 10 to the 120, 10 to the 120, 10 to the 120 pounds, 10 to the 120 uh, as the exponent. It's huge. There's 120 orders of magnitude difference between, between the two. So it can't really just be that. And the, the dark matter, I think there's no, no evidence yet for what it is. Um, yeah, this is, this is a complete unknown at this point. Yeah. Any other questions? So, so Ernie, thanks. For, thanks for your presentation, yeah. really. Um, I appreciate it very much, actually. Uh, the, the crux of it seems to rotate around consciousness or attention or awareness in relation to the tree falling and things existing and giving having purpose for existence rather than in the materialistic sense of kind of classical sciences around the fact that attention is just a, a little substrate that sort of occurred accidentally here mm -hmm. on the side uh, and is relatively irrelevant to to physical uh, stratus that we that we live in on a cosmic or even on a micro level, and then they run into problems on the quantum level, of course, with that with consciousness. So, are you saying pretty much that, like, so if there's a God as a eternally conscious thing which has to remain conscious at all times, or else you didn't stipulate exactly what would happen if it wasn't conscious. That's a little bit of, it's like the chicken trying to understand scrambled eggs. But, um, <laughs> so I'm just, I'm a little uh, trying to figure out, like we've got God as a conscious thing and then yet the tree can fall in the woods and because humans aren't involved, is it, the tree is, how is the tree related to human consciousness? Because how can there be no sound to the tree when there, when God's still conscious? I mean, if God wasn't, then would the tree still exist? <laughs> <So>. <laughs> well, then you have to, if you have a, a virtual universe simulation, then all the processes in it are become part of that simulation too. And so, the, the sound is something that would be, and I would say that if what we're doing as human beings is accepting a data stream coming towards us. It's particular to our own location and space and time of where we are. And that data stream comes to us in a way that you give instructions to an avatar when you're playing the game of, you know, War, War of the Worlds or whatever you play with the avatars. So the, um, it's the, the data stream that has to be sufficient to, to convince you that you're in a real reality. But if you're not there to watch the tree fall, then there's no point in having a data stream, you know, take up its rather valuable space to go where there's nobody to get it, nobody to capture it. Mm. So that there's a strong interactivity somehow between the universe as we create it, as we go along, and the universe as it manifests to us. And it, it all comes down to, to efficient computation, efficient mathematics. And to, again, to me, that's a, a more sensible way to create a reality than to say, well, God snaps his fingers and uh, atoms, were, atoms appear. Well, atoms appear just like that. But if you have a, an imagination, like God probably does have, and the ability to process mathematics efficiently, you can create a world in which all sorts of things happen Virtually, and the virtual is just as good as the real. Mm -hmm. right, it's better because you can do things with the virtual that you can't do with the real. Remember, I talked about the uh, the house made out of water. You can't do that, but you can if you're your universe is a simulation. Why not? Your lines of code. Questions? I've never thought of this before, and you you raise you raise this. Is it possible that when the tree falls, we know? that waves are produced. Now, those waves may not produce a sound unless there is something to hear it, but would they not produce something in the quantum reality that would still exist even though 
it does not reach space time until something has accepted it. Uh, I just, maybe something else receives that as color. Maybe something yeah. else receives that as, as energy of some yeah, sort. Yeah. Could well be. Right? I think the only principle is that it has to operate with a huge amount of efficiency. The maximum efficiency will characterize what, what goes into the data stream and what doesn't. Pretty interesting. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah. Oh, one more. One follow on question. Uh, why is the zero point field called zero point when it's full of vibrations? It's called zero point just because it's there every time you hit the zero. If you, just, if you decrease the property of everything down to zero, uh, the, um, these fluctuations are all that's what's left. You can't get rid of these fluctuations. They're, they're there, built into the fabric of the universe. So they, they can't be made any smaller than, than they are. In fact, the reason that helium does not freeze when you lower to the uh, uh, zero degrees problem is because of this zero point energy is enough to keep it, keep it molten. So helium actually demonstrates the zero point energy is being a real phenomenon. And again, it's called zero point because it's the lowest rate of energy in the universe overall, and because it's there, temperature is zero, I mean, except for the case of million. Yeah. But we could imagine a state where the actual fluctuations go to zero also as well. I mean, that's experienced by Eastern plus Eastern, you know, but in meditation, that the real consciousness, yeah. the, the cosmic consciousness, has zero fluctuations. Because that's when the quietness of the mind is achieved. Mm -hmm. So now, I've done some work to show that because there's a missing physics in quantum itself, which does not allow that zero point state where the fluctuations are also mm -hmm. zero to be to be achieved because of the end of the universe happens at Planck scale because it's definitely several order of magnitudes reality below that, which is not accessible to us. But we have tools and like relatively we can extrapolate to tell us the physicality of that in mathematical form. But that bridge between the zero point field of quantum fluctuations, full of vibrations, wave functions, probabilities, and the zero point actual absolute field mm -hmm. where there's no probabilities, it's absolute state with no fluctuations, that bridge is the missing physics, mm -hmm. which is in my view, prohibiting science to reach that. So it's interesting that you bring that up because he didn't mention it and he's done a lot of research on that bridge. I can share that with you. <laughs> and uh, we, because there is a way what is missing in the relativity physics, in fact, you can extend relativity to explain the inner workings of quantum mechanics by filling in that bridge between the zero point of fluctuations and the absolute zero where relativity ends. It's a, z it's a state of uh, uh, cosmic, cosmic consciousness wherein all the contents of the universe in a state of zero amplitude mm -hmm. and infinite uh, uh, wavelength, but with the actual content, content contained within mm -hmm. that formulation of zero point. Mm -hmm. Rather than actual population. Yeah, maybe you send me something. Yeah, I'll send it. Do you know Tell about his research? By the way, the, uh, yeah, yeah, I read his book. Yeah. I read his paper. I actually oh. read your paper on zero point field. Yeah. And so I have my comments on it, and I'll, I'll discuss that with you. By the way, the zero point field can be reduced to a lower level inside a casimir cavity. That's a, a technical thing. But the casimir cavity allows you to reduce the energy below the, the nominal zero level. And I, I investigated ways in which that might be a way to generate energy. Well, that's where the missing physics of consciousness is. Mm -hmm. He actually has an experiment going on in Toronto trying to capture that. Yeah, and you tell him a little bit about it. It's pretty fascinating. Yeah, we will too. Okay. Yeah. So what we're using is, is the properties of the casual cavity to uh, reduce the, uh, the uh, modes of the zero point field from the bottom up to reduce, reduce the level of energy, eliminate certain modes from the you know, the, the zero point field, and then capture that energy as something moves into and out of the cavity. Um, the whole process is described in a website called Jovian, Jovian.com. Yes? You're saying? Yeah, well, I think people <laughs> want to know about it. <laughs> that's, that's another lecture.
the other question is about, about the lecture tonight. Joebeyond.com. Joebeyond.com. Yeah. Please go back to J-O-B-I-O-N. J-O-B-I-O-N. Joebeyond. Not, not, not Joebeyond. That's, that's Jupiter. Joebeyond is a women's old term I made up myself. Joebeyond.com. Okay. Yeah. So how can we get energy out of the vacuum? That could change the world. Yes. yes. Uh, it's pretty important. <laughs> We, well, we, I, I will say one or two things about it. That is, we actually have a patent. Yeah, that's basically science of meditation. Exactly, it comes to science of meditation to react, to harness that energy, to get to that point of zero, real zero, no fluctuations, no probability, absolute state of zero. And it's not zero, it's absolute state of everything. All right, thank you very much. <laughs>